What's up everybody? So today I'm back with something that's going to be a bit more interesting in regards to the entire domain of philosophy and the history of philosophy. And I'm going to be talking about natural law theory and some preliminary considerations. Now it's quite interesting because of something that I discovered, which I'll get to. So for those of you who don't know, I've been assigned as a teaching assistant for Intro to Ethics while I'm doing my PhD this fall. And we recently got the textbook, I got the textbook sent to me, and it is The World of Philosophy by Stephen M. Kahn. I would not recommend this. I think it is seriously lacking in a lot of areas, especially in the ethics section. But now what I find interesting about this whole idea of ethics and natural law is that in textbooks, including this one, there is nothing mentioned about natural law theory, either classical natural law or new natural law theory. That's weird. It's a very, very powerful ethics, whether you agree with it or not, and it deserves some consideration. So that's something to keep that's something to keep in mind. I don't really know why it is not taught. I don't know why it was never covered in my ethics courses. Discovering it, while I may not agree with it, I do think that it's extremely powerful and has been extremely dominant for hundreds and hundreds of years in the West. So why is it not taught? I don't know. That's something to keep in mind. But I wanted to make this video and possibly a few more explaining some of the preliminary considerations of natural law. Now, you have heard me say before in this video that there is new natural law and there's classical natural law. This is an entire topic to explore on its own, but this is a very important distinction to make. Now, classical natural law is going to be are found mostly in Thomas Aquinas. And it's going to be articulated today by defenders such as David S. Oderberg, Edward Fazer, and some others. New natural law theory is a movement that was born about 50, 60 years ago and is now espoused by people like John Finnis, I think that's how you say it, over in England. And the main difference between these two strands of thought and keep in mind, this is huge. They are, they are completely separate things. You can't get them mixed up. The main difference is that classical natural law is an ethics derived from a metaphysics. New natural law eschews metaphysics in favor of a more phenomenological approach. Let me spell out what I mean by that. So for Thomas Aquinas, natural law theory is going to follow upon his metaphysics, his Aristotelian metaphysics of essence and existence, okay? For John Finus, Finus, however you say it, new natural law theory is going to follow from a phenomenological approach, and it's going to follow from a more modern Humean type metaphysics. So we can talk about that if you'd like, leave a comment below, and I can go over in more detail those differences. I don't want to spend too much time on them now, because I want to focus in on the classical natural law theory. So this brings me to my next point here. Metaphysics, it's not in, in classes, in ethics courses, I have very, very, very rarely, if ever, come across this idea that a metaphysics is derived from an ethics. So that alone should pique your interest. Whether you, or not you agree with natural law theory, you should at least look at it to understand how it works and how it's derived. So I'm going to discuss here with my notes, since it's quite complex, a few ideas about how it's derived. And then I think I'll wrap up. And keep in mind, this is just a preliminary exposition. If you are interested in hearing more about this, I can certainly make more videos. But definitely leave a comment below if you're interested in that. So let's let's get a look in here. Let's take a look here at how a metaphysics can inform an ethics. So let me give a quick summary here of the natural law, then I'll kind of break it down a little bit more. So the natural law can be summed up really as this. Humans pursue perceived goods and avoid perceived evils, okay? Simple. I pursue what I take to be good. I avoid what I take to be evil. Now, what is good in itself is an objective fact embedded in the natural world, and that is the fulfillment of the ends, capacities, and potentials inherent in the essence of a thing. So that's the crucial premise there. So what do I mean by that? Well, I'll spell that out in a minute, but just hold on. 
The conclusion, therefore, after you take these two considerations is that after discovering these ends, what is good, rational people will pursue them. So let's uh, take a little break here and let's kind of unpack what I mean by those things. So remember, first, humans pursue perceived goods and avoid perceived evils. That's the first precept of the natural law. And that should be pretty obvious. Everybody agrees with this. I, you can't really doubt it. You pursue what you take to be good. I pursue what I per take take to be good, I avoid what I per perceive to be evil, etc, etc. That crucial step is that idea that what is good is the fulfillment of these ends, capacities, or potentials inherent in the essence of humans. What the heck does that mean? Well, let's spell it out kind of progressively here. So consider first the realm of mathematics. If I draw a rectangle with precision instruments, then relative to the quickly scribbled rectangle on the whiteboard by a first grader, my rectangle drawn with precision instruments will be better. It will be a good triangle. And that goodness, while it's not moral goodness, it's still an objective goodness because it flows from the essence of what a rectangle is. A rectangle has four sides, etc., etc. We can get into the details there. But a good rectangle is going to instantiate that essence of what a rectangle is. And for those who don't know, an essence is simply a what it is to be a thing. Leave a comment below if you want me to make another video explaining essence. I can go into a lot more detail on that, but, but generally you just think of it as a what it is to be a thing. So a rectangle, triangle, these things have essences, three sides, four sides, certain angles, all sorts of different things, triangularity, etc. So now we have to ask, well, why? See, the reason this, this rectangle, my rectangle drawn with precision instruments is better than the first graders that's quickly scribbled on the board is because the precise triangle instantiates that essence of rectangularity better than the first graders quickly scribbled one, as I mentioned before. It's, more, it's a more true rectangle, you could say, or it lacks more defects than the first graders version. Now, again, this is going to be in the abstract realm of mathematics, but that's the basic idea of what's going on. So let's kind of move into the biological and animal realm where we can notice the same thing. Plants, so for instance, I have shrubs, plants outside. You can look in your backyard, see trees, bushes. Plants more closely approximating their essence are better than the plants that do not do so. For instance, the rose bush that grows into the ground and sucks up nutrients to nourish itself is a good rose, rose bush. It is fulfilling its essence or the what it is to be a rose bush. Again, you can think about, okay, it has thorns, so a rose bush with thorns will be a better one than a rose bush without thorns. A rose bush that actually lives as opposed to just dying is going to be a better rose bush. It instantiates that essence more. And again, the rose bush that fails to fulfill its essence is a bad or defective bush. So that fulfillment of the essence is just what it means to be a good or bad thing. Let me read a quote here from Edward Fazer that sums it up pretty well. Again, he's a defender of this natural law theory and he's living today. So he says, it would be silly to pretend that these judgments of goodness and badness are in any way subjective or reflective of mere human preferences or that the inferences leading to them commit a naturalistic fallacy. For they, meaning these judgments of goodness and badness, simply follow from the objective facts about what counts as a flourishing or sickly instance of the biological kind or nature in question, and in particular from an organism's realization or failure to realize the ends set for it by its nature. Now this same thing is true for animals. So I have a pond out there, and in my pond are some frogs. Suppose that one of these frogs sits out all day and does what a frog is supposed to do, catches food, etc. We talk to a biologist about what exactly is, captures the essence of what it is to be a frog, rather than a fish or something. This would be a good frog. Now suppose that another frog just licks fertilizer off the rocks or off the grass near the pond. That would be a bad frog and it wouldn't last very long. We notice that this is very often the case in nature, but it seems so obvious that it's not worth mentioning. Other examples would include cats that have three legs, lions that don't eat meat, and so on. 
Now, from these examples in the biological sphere, we see that the essence of a thing determines what is conducive to a thing's flourishing. The plant's roots nourishing it are good. The frog eating a proper diet is good. The cat having four legs is good. And things opposed to this, such as the plant's roots not working properly, those things are contrary to a thing's essence, and consequently they are harmful to a thing's flourishing. So now with that in mind, let's kind of move to this human realm. So when considering humans, all of these considerations also apply. Humans have essences from which flow capacities and ends, the fulfillment of which capacities and ends are more or less conducive to flourishing. For instance, humans have an essence of animality, and this means that humans have the poten potencies to eat, sleep, and reproduce, and move, and so on. But as humans, we also have a rational nature, and this means that we have the potencies, potentials, capabilities, whatever you want to call them, to reason and seek truth. A lot more can be said about that. But what we can learn from this is what is good or bad for humans is based on the fulfillment of these ends, which is determined by the essence or the nature of the human, not by this subjective feeling. So again, we see that goodness is determined by what is objectively good, meaning what is fulfilling these capacities that flow from the essence of what it is to be a thing. Again, a human for a human, what it is to be a human is to be a rational animal. So eating, sleeping, reproducing, um, seeking truth, these things are good for the humans. A lot more can be said about this. I'm not going to worry about that. I can make more videos on that, but this is the basic idea. I just want you to understand the structure of how the natural law theory works. <clears throat> so there's a crucial distinction between humans and animals. Humans have a rational intellect and a will, and this allows them to know what is good or bad, which is why good and bad are used in the moral sense when referring to humans. So when referring to humans, we make that jump from natural goodness to moral goodness. So goodness for humans is the fulfillment, and this is a quick summary, of the essence of the human, which is, and this is done, so determining the good is done through, determining and fulfilling the good is done through um, figuring out what the essence is, to figure out what capacities, potentials that, that, ess that flow from that essence, and then obeying those various natural ends that constitute those potencies and those potentialities that flow from the essence. So, quick summary here, and then I'll close. The idea is first that things have essences. And this gets back to what I was saying earlier about how this natural law ethics flows from a metaphysics. Essences are discovered through metaphysical investigation. So for Thomas Aquinas and the natural law theorists, they first approached <coughs> ethics through a metaphysics. They first found out that things have essences and that instantiating these essences following the capacities that flow from these essences, as I've discussed, is what is good for a thing. That's what constitutes a thing's flourishing. So this, these essences direct things towards ends or final causes, as we've discussed. So for instance, the human essence as a rational animal directs humans toward the pursuit of truth. The animal nature directs animals towards procreation, and the organic nature directs plants toward, the, toward living meaning roots expanding, sucking up nutrients. So fulfillment of these ends, meaning the end of procreation, the end of living, denotes what we call good or bad. It's that, that fulfillment of those ends flowing from the essence of a thing is what counts as flourishing for these species. And again, we make that shift with humans in the moral sphere since we have an intellect and can grasp goodness and badness we make that shift into the moral sphere, humans can know what is good or bad for them. Since they, and since they pursue good and avoid evil, once they discover what this natural law demands, once they discover that the natural law demands that you fulfill your final cause or your telos, your capability, your possibility, all these are very interchangeable words in this situation. Once you fulfill that, you the rationality of this is gonna force you to pursue, once you, once you, let me rephrase that, once you figure out what your essence 
demands. So for instance, since you are rational, once you figure out that that demands you to seek truth, as has been argued by natural law theorists, then you are going to do that since this rationality forces you to pursue the fulfillment of such ends. So that's going to be just a short, short overview of the natural law. It, it, I packed a lot of stuff in there, so if you want to see more, definitely let me know. But the main point is that this is a robust ethics that flows from an essentialist metaphysics. And it's not often taught in classes. And I think that it's a quite powerful system. I think that it's used in our, we presuppose it in a lot of our judgments about, say, instance, for instance, mathematics. Whenever we have a pencil and we call it a good pencil, we talk about how, how that pencil fulfills its telos or fulfills what it is, meaning that it, it can write. And if a pencil isn't writing properly, then we say it's a bad pencil. That's just a very simple part or a simple example of this natural law natural goodness, and then we, we abstract and we move up to the moral sphere and we apply that same idea to humans. We say, look, humans have a what it is to be. This what it is to be determines certain potent potentials that humans have to do. When humans aren't fulfilling those potentials, then they're not flourishing. They're not doing what's good for them, and they're bad humans. When they are, that's what goodness constitutes. So goodness is seen as an objective thing that is determined by the natures of things. When, when a human, when a triangle, when an animal is fulfilling its nature, its essence, and fulfilling those ends which that essence sets out, then it's a good animal, human, whatever. That is going to be the key to understanding this nat classical natural law tradition. So again, if you want me to talk more about this, I'd be happy to, but with that, if you want to check out more, check out David Oderberg's work and Edward Faser, F-E-S-E-R. They're going to be the good defenders of this position today. So with that, like, comment, subscribe, and have fun.